This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 603 for August 30th, 2021. Coming up on today's show, welcome to Kinkyville. That's coming up on today's show. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Meeks, and Lusty Guy is with me in the co-host chair today. Happy and lucky to be here, as always. I love how I call it a chair when it's the bed. Well, you know, our bed could be a chair. It's you and me and the dog on the bed. And that doesn't create a disturbing image in the slightest. <laughs> Have we done it from the bathtub before? I think we've done it from the bath. And the hot tub, I think. I did. I've definitely done one from a hot tub, but that was long before I met you. No, you and I did one from the hot tub. Did you? It was a repeat at that time. Uh, at least I have a memory of that, but who knows? I don't even remember. Okay, so you you folks write us and tell us if we've done one from a hot tub or not, because I can't remember. 17 fucking years of podcasting. I can't remember anything. <laughs> we actually have something kind of fun to talk about on the host chat section today. So I was listening to this podcast this week. Actually, it's a repeat. It's an NPR podcast, Hidden Brain which is billed as a conversation about life's unseen patterns. He basically is like a behavioral scientist that talks about our emotions and logic and why people do the things we do. So this particular one was called The Empathy Gap, which to me doesn't make as much sense as the more detailed description that he talks about in the podcast. But what he was saying is that Shankar Vedantam, the host, was saying that we're really terrible at predicting what we are going to do, how we are going to behave when we're in a hot state, when we're scared or sexually aroused or in some type of heightened emotional state. When we are in a cold state, we are terrible at predicting how we're going to act in a hot state. And he gave these examples about this woman who is all sex positive and super safe and got to do safer sex, blah, blah, blah. And she was really aroused and ended up having sex with this guy without a condom twice that's the spoil the punchline so anyway you're like okay it happened it's you know it's it's not the best but and then she did it again because again even though she knew better even though she'd already made the mistake once and regretted it she did it again why because we're really terrible at predicting how we're going to act in a hot state It's one of the reasons why i guess in the military they sleep deprive people and Put them in these, you know, terrible emotional states so that you can get used to acting when you are being fired upon or you're in the mud or what have you. And this supports our idea of, or your idea, I should say, lusty guy, of experience shock. That you just, you don't know how you're going to, you think you know how you're going to act in a situation, but you really don't know. Well, that's right. Anybody who's ever been in a firefight, the military example is a great one, will tell you that you don't know how you're going to respond in a firefight. And you don't know how you respond in your next firefight, even though you were in a last one. And to me, the even more interesting thing about this is that it means as bad as we are about predicting what we will do in an altered state, we are even worse at predicting what others will do when they are in their heated states. This is particularly relevant to me right now, and this is not part of the politics quarter, but it is a little bit of a political topic. As I see all of these commentators over here in the U.S. shaking their fists at that Afghani army, how dare it fail, how dare it collapse, why aren't they running a revolution? It's exactly an example of this phenomenon. We are not living in a falling society. It's really hard to think about what we would actually do in that situation. It's easy for us to say, oh, we would start a revolutionary effort. We would start a guerrilla war. They should do. You know, it's not that clear what you or anyone else will do when the poo hits the fan for real. And even if you've been in a shitstorm or two, you really don't know what you're going to do in the next one. Yeah, it makes me think of reading The Ethical Slut for the first time when uh, Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton say, look, you don't really have a good way of predicting how you're going to act in a situation you've never been in before. So give yourself a break, right? The silver lining is that, as Meeks was saying, there are things you can do to help improve your odds. There, nothing is 100%. But the big thing is practice. Actually, physically practice saying the words, doing the thing. 
while you visualize and or recreate some aspects of that stressful circumstance. We do this in diving training all the time when we're teaching people how to respond in case of emergencies. And emergency responders do it. Military people do it. Law enforcement does it. Hospital uh, ERs do it. Yep. Basically practice. I actually did something like this myself. There was a while back when I was at a party, yeah, pre-COVID, and there was this guy that would basically block me and hug me or touch me in ways that I did not invite and did not want. And I would be mad at myself afterwards. I'm like, why didn't I stop him? You know, I teach this. I know this. I know my limits. Why didn't I stop him? I got really mad at myself. And then, of course, everybody said, don't get mad at yourself about that. But I realized that what I need to do is practice. So it's a friend of a friend who hosts these wonderful parties. And so before her next party, in case he was going to be there, I actually practiced saying what I was going to say and doing what I was going to do physically, actually saying out loud and actually making the motion because I didn't want that to happen again. Absolutely. Now, this applies in all kinds of circumstances, by the way. I used to recommend to young parents that they start practicing the sex talk with their kids while they were changing diapers. Mm -hmm. Long before the kids could understand a word of what you were saying, just to start establishing the pattern of being a reasonable person, communicating with your kid, even though the topic was sex. Bodily autonomy, very important. Very Even important. from babyhood. Really interesting twist in terms of polyamory and legal issues. Did you see the poly in the news post that Harvard Law is working on protections for poly folks? I'll put a link in the show notes. Basically, Harvard Law has put together a poly rights effort, which is called PLAC, P-L-A-C, the Polyamory Legal Advocacy Coalition. There's an article about it in Harvard Law called Poly in the Law that goes into a little bit more detail. And this group is a coalition of academic and legal professionals, and it works to advance civil and human rights of polyamorous people, communities, and families through legislative advocacy, public policy, and public education. We have fucking Harvard on our side. That's pretty cool. That is very cool. That is very... I have to say, though, plaque. <laughs> really? P-L-A-C. Plaque? P-L-A-C. It's plaque. <laughs> Yeah, there's nothing redeemable about that, is there? <laughs> no, I'm trying to think of... So there's a different word for things that are acronyms, P-L-A-C, versus acronyms that are meant to be pronounced like that. Oh, really? I, yeah, and I can't remember what the second word is. <laughs> Back to menopause. I didn't know it existed. I remember hearing about it on a Grammar Girl podcast. I'll look up the Grammar Girl podcast and put a link in the show notes. Hey, tangent. Woohoo, it's fun. Little hat tip to my grammar geeks out there. I have a right not to be vaccinated. Masks are a violation of my civil rights. Freedom! Freedom. Freedom. D-U-M-B. You all have heard those cries from folk on the right in regards to our most recent upsurge in COVID cases vis-a-vis -vis the Delta variant. And in general, the conservative chorus has been singing that song since the start of the contagion. Let's break down why it's bullshit from the beginning picture, from the big picture, to the details. First of all, let's just take it as a given that one does have a right to refuse a vaccine and or to wear not wear a mask. That's not true, by the way, but we'll, we'll get to that later. For the sake of argument, let's say the right to directly breathe your spittle-filled exhalations into the surrounding air is, in fact, enumerated in the Constitution, just like the right to free speech, free religion, and to bear arms. In that imaginary case, the right to breathe without a mask or refuse the vaccine would be no more absolute than any of those other rights. For all that we have a right to free speech, we don't have a right to publish child pornography, state secrets, or... As that famous saying goes, scream fire in a crowded theater. That's kind of a fucked up example, by the way, but we'll just run with it for now. We are free to worship as we see fit, unless that worship involves human sacrifice, taking peyote a sacrament, or using sex as a holy ritual. 
And while lots of us argue over the details of what that right to bear arms means, just about none of us think that private individuals have a right to own nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. There are limits to every right, just as there would be to these imagined rights to avoid a vaccine or not wear a mask. Now, the courts have long decided that the government has the ability to limit those rights promised by the Constitution when there's a compelling need to do so and when the limitations are carefully tailored to be no more restrictive than required. So, the state can criminalize child pornography, say, since it has the power and obligation to protect children, but it can't ban all adult material across the board. Now, if there was a right to go with it on a, without a mask, and again, there isn't, the state would have the ability to limit that right when there was a compelling need in limited ways. So requiring mask wearing in public spaces, while not doing so in private spaces, would represent just such a legitimate use of state power, tailored and specific, addressing a real need, and as limited as possible. So even if our conservative thinkers had a right to go without a mask, which again, they don't, the state would have the ability to limit that right, just like all the others. But, you know, we don't have to be hypothetical about this. We don't have to avoid the conservative observation that a vaccine is much different than a mask. Being compelled to have a chemical injected into one's body is very different than being compelled to wear a mask in public. The conservatives will cry and they would be right. My body, my choice, they chant. Sure, <laughs> they have made a compelling argument. They haven't. They have just revealed that they've never heard of Jacobson v. Massachusetts from 1905, where the U.S. Supreme Court settled this issue decisively. You see, vaccine resistance is nothing new. Back then, the plague in question was smallpox. Know anyone who's ever had it? No. You know why? Because vaccines fucking work. But let's set that aside and get back to this court case in question. Jacobson was a pastor who refused to take the smallpox vaccine and was fined $5, about 150 bucks in today's money for that refusal. He then refused to pay the fine and took the case to court where it ended up at the Supreme Court that ruled that states do have the power to compel vaccinations. There were lots of reasons, lots of rationale, including the notion that if the state could draft someone and compel them to the fight to the death in the defense of the nation, it can surely compel someone to take a vaccine to defend their fellow citizens from infection. Conservatives like to make the false point that constitutional issues of freedom are at stake in wearing a mask or getting a vaccination. But they aren't. The courts have spoken over 100 years ago on the issue and rightly found that forcing people to take a vaccination during a plague is a reasonable restriction of the individual's right to dictate their own actions. And at this point, anyone who would say otherwise is just telling you they don't understand the legal context without saying they don't understand the legal context. Boom. <clears throat> if you have questions, comments, or feedback, you can call 802-505-POLY or email polyweekly at gmail.com and attach an MP3 file with your questions. To book us or anything that involves a calendar, this means if you want to pitch us to appear on our show, then please email lustyguy at polyweekly.com. And by the way, an acronym is made up of parts of the phrase it stands for and is pronounced as a word, like AIDS. An initialism is an acronym that is pronounced as individual letters, like DNA, IRS, IRS, or PLAC. Yeah, we'll see how that works out. And now for today's main topic, a interview with the creators of Welcome to Kinkyville. I'm really excited to have with me today two new guests, Emily Blake, who is a polyamorous switch and screenwriter and a cosplayer. Yay! Pop culture geek. I was putting together my pirate outfit to go to Ren Faire tomorrow. Nice. Awesome. And the creator of Welcome to Kinkyville and a and d player and occasional voice actor. Also, Gabriel Figueroa, born in Puerto Rico. He is a professional trailer editor in Hollywood, and he is the director of Welcome to Kinkyville. And he uses Twitter to raise awareness about polyamory and kink. Welcome, Emily and Gabriel. Hi. Hello. 
Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Super excited about your new animated series. Welcome to Kinkyville. So let's dive in. Emily, why did you decide to create this? I work in the film industry. It's funny, in my bio, I forgot to mention what my actual job is. I'm a script supervisor, but I write screenplays and I was writing a screenplay about uh, a polycule and it wasn't working. And I just thought, okay, what if I have these two characters who are, as a frame of the story, they have this show called How to Be Kinky. And it's just two people in front of a ring light. It's nothing complicated. And then the more I worked on those scenes, the less I cared about the rest of the screenplay and the more I yeah. do this. And so, and then I was going to maybe like, okay, maybe I can actually make this. And then I met a producer friend of mine who was like, don't do two people in front of a ring light. It can be bigger. <laughs> and then I started growing and growing and growing. And then we turned it animated. And um, it's largely motivated by the fact that I felt like I was answering the same questions over and over again from newer kinksters, particularly younger kinksters, more often than not women, more often than not subs. And the same question over and over again was sort of like my dom says that he has to slap me in the face and I don't really like being slapped in the face but he says I have to do it because he's my dom and in order for being a good sub I just have to do what I'm told and I got sick of answering that question over and over and over again and I was like there are kink resources out there but it's not like with the ethical slut it's not like there's one book that everybody shoves at you when you're new there's a bunch of different scattered resources so I thought there should be a, a high production value entertaining source that people people can come to to get the basics when they're new to kink. That's the objective. I love that. And I really hear answering the same questions over and over again after 17 years of Polly Advice podcast, you know, yeah. you see, but a lot of times people can't don't realize their question is the same as somebody else's and they don't realize it's even OK to ask a question. So I'm super excited about that. How did Gabriel get involved with this? Emily and I were at the time in a relationship and initially I was just being the supportive boyfriend. Was, oh, that's so great. Yeah, I know. And just rooting for her. And then the pandemic happened and my work slowed down. And then I had all this time on my hands and which I was spending a lot of it with Emily and, and then just hearing more about the project in detail and was able to start seeing what she really her vision and then basically it became this moment of like well I have this time on my hands and I have resources I think I can actually uh, help you bring this to life and actually make it even bigger still and then we uh, we basically made some arrangements about what our roles would be and then we were off and then we this was a year and a half ago most of that year was just spent trying to find an, a company an animation studio for the project yeah why did you decide on animated as opposed to live action was that a COVID concern well I were again I work in live action i work on film sets and so originally it was going to be live action and then COVID hit and i was like not having ever worked in animation i was like okay we'll make it animated thinking that that would be much faster animation would be faster yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I, didn't, I didn't know it's not cheaper it's not faster but once we started thinking about the animation i realized how much more we can do with it because there's a lot of magical realism in it now that couldn't have happened in live action and i can do a little bit of nudity without it being awkward for the actors without it being maybe possibly off-putting to people i realized that the animation since we're trying to appeal to people who might find it intimidating to go to a dungeon or to get on fet life and i think I think having it be animated means it's a little less intimidating. It's a little more friendly. And I can show some more racy stuff without it being as awkward. Or fetishistic. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what really got me when she actually came up with the ad to make it animated. That's what I think when I was like, wait, no, I think you, you're onto something here. And I could see how this all of a sudden could just actually have even a bigger reach than originally we, she was envisioning. Yeah, I was wondering if it was to make it more accessible because there's some people that just aren't going to watch something that is live action because, oh, it's porn, it's nudity, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. Has been very much on my mind that we we are very clear that this is not porn. And the magical realism is just we saw an opportunity because the way we experience kink can be so subjective. So we we just set us opportunity an opportunity to play with magical realism a lot. So what is the plan for this? Is this going to be a you know scripted X number? part series? It depends on how much money we make and whether or not we get bought. So right now, the objective is uh, we're kickstarting our pitch pilot, which is a pitch pilot is basically a pilot episode. At this point, it's shorter. It's going to be shorter than a regular episode. But if we make enough money, we can make it full length. So you take the pitch pilot and you go to networks and you pitch the series and then they give you money and they let you go make it. <laughs> and that's the objective right now. If by some chance they don't give us the money to go make it, then we will go back to Kickstarter probably and try to fund an entire season based on the success of that pilot. But we think um, 
I feel pretty good about it. I think we can get buy-in from the studios if we pitch it right and if this pitch pilot is really successful. Part of the goal of the Kickstarter also is to help quantify the value of the idea is to show one of the things I tell people a lot is I don't want to just reach our goal. I want to surpass a goal because we want to show a potential studio that there is an audience for this, that people do want to see this. And the success of the Kickstarter will definitely be one of the deciding factors on how appealing this project could be to a studio. So I'm curious, let's say that you do get a season. What are the main kink topics that you consider the most urgent to cover in this? Now, I'm going to tell a little story, reason why I'm asking. So a couple of years ago, I was on a panel at Geek Girl Con along with Alina Gabash and I think Mac McGregor and some other folks about Polly and Kink 101. It was one of those late night sessions. They put you in the late night, so uh-huh. I don't know, it's a dull topic, right? Whatever. So we said, hey, you know, we're just a panel. We don't have anything prepared. So just ask your questions. What do you want to know about cr- kink? And of course, crickets, crickets, crickets. <laughs> And after like what felt like three minutes of silence, what was probably about 10 seconds, somebody raised her hand and said, what about anal fisting? (laughs) And we're like, okay, so (laughs) don't break to that. So so that is a place that we could start. (laughs) And then, of course, after that, you know, the more nuanced questions came in, but they didn't know how to ask the nuanced questions right off the bat. So they just picked the one thing that was, I guess, a hard limit to them, which is anal fisting. So assuming that anal fisting is maybe not the most urgent kink topic that most folks need to know about, what are the main points you want to hit in that first season? Definitely, I want to start with, with sort of safety and understanding how to protect yourself. So I want to talk about fake doms and a sub frenzy. I want to talk about sub drop, dom drop. I want to talk about red flags. That's the big primary goal with all of this. But then I also want to sprinkle in some specific stuff. Like I'd love to talk about, I think feet is a really popular foot, and maybe body part fetishes also just in general, but you know, things like that, maybe impact play, depending on what network we end up with. We could talk about second workers. <laughs> um, I would, sure the network will have thoughts also. Yeah, that's also very true. The network will have a lot to say about about how we do this. And that's part of the consideration. The episode that I keep telling Emily that I'm most passionate about, because, of course, the, the king, is, we, we very much uh, reference a lot. Adam Rose everything who he'll pick a subject and then through that subject, he'll start unpacking other facts about life and society. And the thing I tell Emily that the one episode that I'm very passionate about is Japanese rope bondage. One, clearly, where did it come from? How did it make its way into the West? But then also, I think it's a great opportunity to explore and talk a little bit about cultural appropriation. Because one of the things that nods at me a lot in the kinky scenes is usually white guys wearing kimonos. Like, why do you have to wear a kimono for Japanese rope bondage? Like, why is that a thing? You know, they're really comfortable. Yeah, I are really comfortable. I'm sure, I'm sure they're. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they are. But is it cultural appropriation? Is are we fetishizing another culture, or, or is that in itself a fetish, or is it role playing? And and I think that's an example of something where you actually can start peeling layers yeah. and see a situation from different angles too. Well, I do also definitely along the down the line, I would love to do an episode on race play that I will bow out of. I would bring in somebody else to take my place on that episode. But I think it would be like stuff like that. I definitely do want to talk about. But I feel like that's me. Maybe after we've established ourselves a little bit first and then we start to really poke at those kind of things. Are there any myths in particular that you're just really itching to dispel? Definitely the idea that if you're a sub, you just have to do what you're told. And if you're a dom, you have to be a dick all the time. (laughs) (laughs) For me, the myth is that for some reason, when people think kink, they automatically think of the most cinematic visual there is, like leather and chains. And kink can sometimes be just so small. It can just be dirty talk or just stockings such star and strong imagery Mm -hmm. and it's like no kink can also be just really small type of details in in sex or or not necessarily having to do with sex and you don't have to be you know a leather clad goth girl to be into kink and you know on the other end you don't have to be christian gray (laughs) you can just be a regular old normal looking person on the street that doesn't call attention yourself and have all these things that you enjoy doing in the bedroom there's it's a completely normal thing for people to want to experience Excellent. So I posted to Facebook sort of last minute to see if anybody had any questions about kink that they might like to see addressed in your series. And so far we have one response from Angie who says, what is good for experienced players to do to encourage and support people who are new? One of the things that I find is just being willing to talk about it with a very logical approach. I used to be a school teacher and one of the things that I learned, I taught high school, and one of the things that I learned was if the kids start out asking questions about sex. 
And I actually taught in a abstinence only program, but fuck it. I taught about oh. sex anyway. Oh, um, oh, I was, I was oh, shut the door and be like, don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> because there were so many myths that they had that were horrible. And uh, one of the things I learned, though, is if you say the word penis and vagina and you don't laugh and you don't act like it's funny, you just say them as the facts that they're just the words that you use. The kids would respond in kind. We're talking about teenagers and they wouldn't laugh if I didn't laugh. And I carried that over when I talked to people about kink. You know, sometimes they start out being sort of giggly or embarrassed about it. And I talk to them very matter of fact, as if there is nothing to be ashamed of. And it's a perfectly normal discussion. You know, it's just like we're talking about what soda we like to drink. It's a perfectly normal thing to talk about. I find that that is the best way to approach anybody new because a lot of new people are really nervous and there's a lot of shame still in there. And for me, the most important thing is to approach it as if there is absolutely nothing to be ashamed of. Here, here. So true. I find that you model the behavior and the attitude you want to get. And if you act like it's no big deal, I say this about Polly all the time. Like when people are coming out, I'm like, look, if you model that this isn't a big deal and it's how you live your life and it's perfectly healthy for you and it makes you happy, that's that. And if you don't act like it's some big secret or like it's something that you're ashamed of or go in with a chip on your shoulder and act like you think you're better than everybody else, like they will will mimic whatever your attitude is. That's absolutely true. I love it. Okay, so when are we going to be seeing something from you? You are launching the Kickstarter soon, is that right? August 10th. I think this is probably coming out after that. Uh, so we launched our Kickstarter on August 10th. And so I guess it ends on September 10th. Are there about the the weekend after Labor Day weekend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, after Labor Day weekend. So, wow. so there's only a few days left, but you can still contribute. We still have plenty of rewards because most of our rewards are digital. And the numbers, really, even if you only contribute like ten dollars, just having those numbers really helps us when we go to network. In the in the long term, too, to just show that there is an audience for this. One of the things that we were very clear when we first started creating the project is that we wanted to create something that would appeal to vanilla people or curious people. That we weren't just making something for the kinky community because we knew that wouldn't necessarily just appeal to a network if we went after such a small target audience. And I'll tell you one of the funny jokes while creating the show uh, mix is that the first couple designs we would get from animators about Emily or the co-host Javay. Uh, yeah, Jav we haven't mentioned Javay. She's actually a sex educator. So I'm a writer and she actually knows what she's talking about. <laughs> Yeah, some of the first character designs were very fetishistic and the feedback we would give animators be like, less hot topic. Like we we want to we, wanna, <laughs> we want something welcoming, you know, warm. Like this this cannot look like this cannot look like a David Fincher movie. Although I know? do shop a lot at Hot Topic. Uh, hot, topic is awesome. <laughs> hot Topic is awesome. You know, it's funny when I uh, was publishing my looking for a cover for my my book, Eight Things I Wish I'd Known About Polyamory before yes. I fractured mm -hmm. it up. Uh, I got the same thing from my illustrator. It was all like, you know, 20-year-old white people like looking super sexy and super on the edge, right? And I'm like, no, no, no. I want everybody to be able to see themselves in this. I don't want I don't want it to be just young people. I don't want them to be dressed a certain way. And so that's why we ended up with, uh, it was just fingers. Like, yeah. Like so this children on fingers. It's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was like, oh, that's so cute. Now, how can anybody think that Polly is like scary or super sexy or racy when you're just looking at like smiley faces yeah. and on fingers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, super approachable. Cool. Well, it's been lovely talking with you. I'm super excited about your product. Hmm. Thank I'm super you. Thank excited. You. Hold on. Sorry, I said the wrong thing. I'm super excited about your project. And as we said, the, there's about a, a week, a couple of days still left in the Kickstarter. So please do check it out. And where can people find that and you online? Welcome to kinkyville.com. And our handle on all our social media is kinky, at kinkyville TV. Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So welcome to kinkyville.com. That's where you want to go. Yeah, that'll take you awesome. straight to the Kickstarter. And the trailer that I made. Yes, he's a trailer <laughs> editor. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> awesome. Oh, and and then Nick, sorry to interrupt you, but we should also mention to your audience that you, you and Lusty Guy make an appearance on our trailer. You sure do. I get to, yes, you're right. We should have mentioned that. Yeah, yeah. We actually did a little bit of voiceover. Most of mine was grunting. It's a pleasure pain. <laughs> <laughs> look for this look for the spanking couple in the trailer. That the voices are Lusty Guy and Connie Minks, although funny fact, the spanking top in that scene is actually drawn in my likeness. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> That's my cameo in the trailer, the character drawn by me that is voiced by Lusty Guy. <laughs> yeah, that was super duper fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. um, well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. And um, good luck with your project. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome to kinkyville.com. <laughs>
And thanks again to Gabriel and Emily for joining us. Really excited. There are a few days left in their fundraiser, so please go and check that out as soon as you hear this. If you'd like to contribute to the conversation, you can comment on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash polyweekly, Twitter at polyweekly or at cunning minx, Instagram at cunning.minx, or now on TikTok as cunning minx. And this show's feedback we got via Instagram, which I know made Minx happy. <laughs> and it says, hey, Minx, this is random, but I love your podcast. And I'm actually the Joe featured in episode 532. All right, trivia bus. Somebody tell me what that was about. I don't know. Things have changed a lot since then. And I'm solo poly with one partner. You have helped me change my life in such a positive way. I actually used to talk to my therapist about how I've learned about the same amount of emotional intelligence from your show that I've got from therapy. Ooh, we're cheap therapy. I love it. The main reason I'm messaging you is that you followed my friend Jen, and she is fucking thrilled, and she texted me to let me know. You really made her day, and it was awesome, so thank you. You're welcome. Aww. I, every now and then I go through Instagram and just follow people that commented or liked my posts or that look interesting. It's time for your Happy Polly Moment of the Week, brought to you by Fubbly Polly and Wrists Everywhere. This week's Happy Polly Moment is from S, who said, My wife and I have been together for 11 years and have explored polyam since the beginning. Hookups were really our thing. We met people in the swinging community, and that really didn't vibe with us either. We happily just left ourselves open to seeing what life blew our way. May of 2021, we were chatting with a friend of a friend who was in town for a picnic and instantly sparked. After some getting to know you texting, my wife and I made the 1,400 mile flight to our new friend's hometown. Dinners, drinks, sightseeing, and electricity for four great nights made the flight home bittersweet. Long distance works for all of us right now, so I'll enjoy my glow and the NRE. That's new relationship energy. Minx, I want to thank you for your podcast. I definitely didn't have the vocabulary nor the emotional IQ to properly approach my polyam journey before your show. Thank you for your contribution to the polyam community. Aw, well, thank you for writing in, S. We have a new Poly Weekly Playmate at the highest level, $9.99 a month. Wow. I know. We don't get too many at that level. It's kind of a big deal. Yeah, welcome, Big Spender. We are happy to introduce JB as our new Polly Weekly Playmate. Well, I think that about wraps it up for today's show. I do want to thank all of our Polly Weekly Playmates for their generous donations this month. We are a free resource. We've helped hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to and continued success with polyamory. And your donations keep the podcast free for everybody, both inside and outside the community. Thanks so much for listening, sharing, following, liking, reviewing, and remember, it's It's not not all about about the sex. sex.